1948, stricken with tuberculosis, George Orwell wrote his final novel, 1984. In it, he envisaged a surveillance, silent, a surveillance state built on constant observation through telescreens, devices with cameras and microphones that are always on and always listening, or smartphones as we would call them today. What he failed to envisage was the scale at which this would expand to, and the amount of data that people would, private, that would, people would volunteer up without, and in the biggest fear that nobody is actually watching them. In the short time I make this talk, people upload half a million photos to Instagram, make nearly five million tweets, and nearly 40 million Google searches. Every click, swipe, tweet, like is stored and owned somewhere by someone. Do we really know what happens to it? We're standing on the edge of this mass harvesting of data that could unlock untold advances in society, healthcare, agriculture, but also could undermine our democracy, liberty, and privacy. I argue that human-centered data offers the pathway to a more prosperous future. So starting with the downside, the Cambridge Analytica scandal revealed the extent to which data from millions of people was used to allegedly influence elections and referendums throughout the world in many countries, but most famously in the UK and the US. We're only really coming to terms with the consequences of this mass harvesting of data and what it means when people can know our likes, our dislikes, what makes us tick, and then sell it back to us throughout the democratic process. In an ever more polarized world, the center ground of undecided people that actually swings elections becomes ever smaller, and thus the potential for data harvesting and targeted ads becomes ever bigger. But there's hope with this mass collection of data as well. What if I told you that out of those 40 million Google searches that happens in the short time of this talk, the amount about flu symptoms was to double or triple or quadruple in Milton Keynes? This is something that's actually been investigated and they found that Google searches about flu symptoms were able to predict outbreaks with a 97% accuracy, but four weeks ahead of the Center for Disease Control in America. In, and then think about what this might mean in countries and places where the access to the old fashioned ways of health interventions are less developed and less available. Time saving could become life saving here. But again, there's a risk and a downside there's examples of people's search history about mental health and physical health being used to lock them out of health systems, being used to influence their medical insurance premiums. And a pertinent example happened recently in West Virginia where they have attempted to force teachers to use Fitbits in exchange for their medical insurance through their work. So the same idea of kind of information that should theor that could theoretically be neutral can be used to enable early interventions and early treatment of diseases, or to ensure early lockout of the same medical systems. And what defines how this data is used is the ownership and the purpose of it, and this is what we need to take back control of. So human-centered data is a combination of legislation and citizen-led approaches to taking back control of this data for a more healthy future. So starting with the legislation, GDPR is a re recent policy that actually gives us the right to be the owner of our data, to know how it is used, and if we are uncomfortable, for it to be deleted. But in the same way that all these flu, flu symptom searches or democratic processes rely on mass harvesting of data and mass amounts of people, changing how institutions use our data is really gonna take mass action in the same way. One person deleting their data is not really gonna change how it operates. It needs to be organized and collective interventions. Examples of how this has been done in the past, um, 2010 gives quite an interesting example where in Holland, people threatened mass withdrawal of their money from a state-owned bank over excessive bonus policies, and this forced change in how they acted. Similarly, the, uh, the example of where in West Virginia they forced teachers to wear Fitbits, this was resisted through mass strike action. What might happen to the large tech companies and large social media companies if they were faced with threatens of millions or billions of people withdrawing their data? Their models would have to change. But outside of these examples of how to change the existing tech companies and tech institutions, as examples of people and places building a new form of internet that's built on open sharing and open ownership. I think the most, ex uh, most knowledgeable example people will be familiar with is Wikipedia which states explicitly in its terms that no one, no matter how skilled, has the right to act as if they are the owner of a page. This has led to a development of a library of 50 million pages that is generated, updated, and created by us and for us. 
Similarly, another example is open street maps where citizens using phones are able to map the world around us and help us to navigate it. So take an example of Kibera, where, an area where I research. It's the largest slum in East Africa, home to between one and two million people, with a density comparable to that of New York, but without the skyscrapers. So you can see from the picture how dense it is. But only 10 years ago, there was basically nothing to show for it when you used online maps. There was one or two roads, but in terms of delivering services, you really didn't know too much. But open street maps allowed citizens armed with mobile phones to map what was important to them. So buildings, paths, hospitals, institutions have all been mapped to a mass density. And now, if you're working in this area as I am, this data is openly available and openly accessible to work with. These two examples um, really embody the kind of idea of the internet that Tim Berners-Lee envisaged when he was inventing it. And his decision not to patent the internet in the first place is what enabled it to become what it is today. And he himself is now working on a platform called Solid, which in the, in the internal infrastructure of the internet returns the right of ownership and consent to us uh, along the lines of GDPR. So it's, it's virtual storage pods of our own data that for people to use needs to be explicitly termed in our consent but we give it, it's more akin to renting out our data as opposed to the current model where we give it away to large tech companies and then it can be sold on and used in ways that we're unsure about. So taking all these examples, I think we can start to imagine what a better future for the internet would look like. I argue it consists of three points, legislation, action, and creation. So legislation, we need to ensure that policies like GDPR that enshrine our rights to have our data in our own ownership and the right to be deleted and forgotten is maintained and enforced. Secondly, action, we need to use that right to enable mass action against tech companies and social media companies that we feel uncomfortable with to change how their policies around privacy are used. And thirdly, creation, building the new institutions of the internet on the grounds of open source, open sharing of knowledge. I think with these three actions, we can start to build a better future for everyone and a better internet. Thank you very much.